Chapter 10, Batch Processing. With this chapter, we are getting into a new section of this book, which is the final section of derived data. So far, we have looked at data stores and data systems that are single source of truth, the source of truth data systems. Now we're gonna look at data systems that are derived from those single source of data truth systems. And we're gonna look at how index are built. We'll look at how uh, analytics systems actually work and what are some of the examples that we have today in the Hadoop ecosystem. So let's look into it. To understand batch data processing, I would say that this entire industry of batch data processing is inspired by Unix. So let's take an example to understand why that's the case. Let's say you have an access log that you have on your website uh, and you want to find out who, which, which, uh, which file was the most requested in a given day. Right? or which file was the most requested for this entire month. Right? That could be a specific HTML, specific CSS, or whatever that is. You want to find out what is the most in-demand in file that your server is serving. If you had one machine, you could easily do this batch data processing job using a simple Unix command. And that's why I feel if we will learn how using this simple command, you can do this insight but at the same time, this entire MapReduce and you're gonna learn a lot more about various systems, they're all inspired through this simple Unix command. So let's look at how we would write that script, right? So what you would do is you would first look at this script and you find out, oh, this is actually uh, split by spaces. You can split this by spaces, right? So if you wanna find out the file name, right? Uh, then you would find out that it is number one, then there's a space, dash, space, uh, so the typical format is the IP address, dash, and then the user ID, and then the date. And then there's the HTTP command, get, post, put. Uh, and then there's the file name, and then there's HTTP protocol. There's the HTTP server response code, there's the file size, and then the referral, and then the user agent, right, which is the browser ID reference. So this is a typical one line of your record. And you want to find out how many times uh, you have a specific file being requested, right? So in this case, uh, file name, unique file name is at the sixth position. So if you look at this one, two, three, four, five, and six, right? So there are six spaces in between, there are five spaces in between. And so you can get this file name by, by simply writing this command, cat, the name of the file, and then pipe it with an with the awk awk and then print the sixth variable. Zeroth variable will have this entire field, first, second, third, fourth, fifth. So then it will start printing and extracting. It's filtering out all the file names, right? That's what this command is doing. And then you pipe that um, to the sort function, which basically then gets all, um, all of those file names uh, sorted by that file name. So if you had, let's say, 100 references of one, then all, they all get together into one, one sorted function, right? So then it sorts them. And then you pipe that by unique minus C, right? And so now you start, minus C is a counter. You're saying, you're, you're saying now count each one of the unique ones. So if you have 10 references of 1.css, then it will have a, a count. It, this output would be 10 and then 1.css, space 1.css. 22.css or whatever that is, right? So it will uniquely count all of those sorted file names references. Once having done that, you can pipe that to say, hey, sort in the reverse order and uh, on the number field, which is the first field. And so then it will start to sort. Um, um, typically, if, we don't, if you don't write minus R, it will sort through ascending order, but you want to get the largest number of files requested, number of files that are requested the maximum number of times, right? So then you do sort, you pipe that by sort, and then you get uh, the re reverse order of how many file, how many times a given file was requested. And then you say, hey, just give me the first five of them, right? Because you're only interested in one, but let's say you, you just said, give me first five. So head minus N total number of records that I want from the sorted order is five. So take a look what happened. With this, you can very quickly get the insight you want. If you had one machine with one log, uh, one big log, then you can do this very efficiently. You'd be surprised how efficient this sort is within Unix. And uh, it uses the power of multiple CPUs, it parallelizes that. 
it, uh, it has uh, overflow into disk that it can do. It doesn't have to remain in memory. So all of these functions, right, that are piped are unique in themselves. They do specific things, but they do that really well. And so that's one thing that we noticed, right? We could get the insight we, we need, but look at how unique Unix has uh, made it. Such an easy job, right? You can pipe through various different functionalities like unique sort, arc, um, head, and a whole host of other functionalities. You can compose one output to the other output, right? And you can as if uh, match each of these, right? You could, you could mix and match in the way you want. So there is this functionality of it has a uniform access of like, uh, you know, file input, right? It is uniform. Each of these uh, have a standard in, standard out. So it has a, it has uniform access. Uh, and you can see there's a clear logical separation between each, each step, right? Uh, and then you can build this incrementally. You don't have to build all of this command uh, and you can experiment through it. You could just first print the sticks to, to ensure that you're actually printing out the file name and counting the file names. So, this ability to experiment, build over time, having a uniform interface, and having logical separation. These are the foundations of Unix well before in 2000s when BAT systems were introduced. So these foundations are exactly what's, what is going to be used by the BAT systems, right? So the, the very famous one is MapReduce uh, paradigm of batch processing, right? Um, and it does something very similar. And this Unix example will, will go along all throughout. It has this abstraction of mapper and uh, an abstraction of reducer. So we have mappers and we have reducers. So think about mappers as just filters. It's basically filtering out. You saw here, it was filtering out only the field that you needed, right? So mappers are basically, let's say you wanted to do the exact same thing in MapReduce, right? You wanted to count how many times, uh, which was the one top five, let's say, uh, files that were requested, right? So the way you would do this in MapReduce is you would first have a filtering logic, which is what the mappers does. You would break down this file, let's say this file is across multiple um, machines because in this case it was one machine that was doing Unix processing for that but now let's say you have multiple logs across multiple machines and you have thousands of machines right so how would you do that that's where you need uh, a concept of map reduce uh, or something along those lines which can work across machines right so then what you would do is you would have uh, a mapper that basically filters out what you need right once you have that filtered you would create a set of tuples which basically um, you choose the right key for this. If you choose the right key, um, then you can have an output which is keyed off of that. The output, basically you can think about this as a um, filtering step. It filters out what it needs and then the reducing step is basically it uh, aggregates what it needs, right? So here if you see it's counting, right? In unique it's counting and it's then sorting and then uh, it's returning the top five. Same thing. Think about this as a filter step and this as where it will sort and also do the count and then give you the final output. So let's look at this example, right? So mapper and reducers are abstractions which enable you to work in this distributed file system, right? And, and this entire system is this Hadoop ecosystem. Um, but think about that abstraction which can allow you to have a filter step and then gives you capability of reducing step which is basically summarizing. So filtering and summarizing. That's mapper and reducer, right? So filtering, summarizing. So let's look at how that would happen with, with let's say you had thousands of these log entries, right? And now we, let's say we only have two files, right? 1.css and 2.css. So in the first machine, it decides to go through 1.css and 2.css and then it is mapper m1. So let's call this m1. And so what it will produce is af after reading every line, it will produce a tuple that says I am mapper m1 and I saw an instance of 1.css so it creates this tuple output right and then it, when it goes to the second line it says oh I am mapper m1 I see 2.css and goes on and on and on so it creates this output which is basically a filtering step that's what the mapper does so this is m1 which is right here and this output is what it materializes and stores it so it just stores m1 r1 m1 r2 m1 r3 
The R are basically the keys. In this case, the key for us is the file names, right? So that is what the mapper does. It keys off the right things that it's interested in. So in this case, it creates this output and the same M2 will go through its log files and it will create M2, 2.css, M2, 2.css, M2, 1.css, and so on and so forth. So now M1 and M2 creates this mapper output. Now, what happens? If you see these arrows, the reducers, there's, there's a coordinator that knows that, hey, this reducer is only responsible for R1 key, and this reducer is only responsible for R2 key. So what happens is all of those, so in this example, let's say this reducer is only responsible for 1.css counting, and this reducer is only responsible for 2.css counting. So all of those output that had 2.css in it, all of those tuples, uh, what, so, so the first step of the mapper is to filter, but also it sorts them. So it knows exactly what, what keys are where. And so once those keys are sorted, it's moved to the reducer. It's literally moved um, from the file system of this machine to this other reducer's file system, where it, it all of those 1.css records across multiple machines that are sorted are moved to the reducer. Once the reducer gets it, now it has a complete view of all references of 1.css. It sees, oh, 1.css existed in one, mapper one. It also existed in mapper two. Pardon me, this is wrong. So this is mapper two. And so then it, it knows that it only has two instances. So what it does, it counts, and then it prints out 1.css two instances. Similarly, mapper two realizes, oh, 1.css, a uh, 2.css was also in mapper one. 2.css came also again from mapper 1, 2.css came from mapper 2, and 2.css also came from mapper 2, and it realizes that there are four such uh, tuples. So then it outputs 2.css was um, uh, seen four times, 1.css was seen two times. So you might be wondering, this is such a simple step, right? Why would you go through this, this entire abstraction of mapper and reducer and doing this, right? But, but you get the gist of this, right? Mapper is basically filtering. Once it's filtered and sorted, it's moved to the right reducers where it's actually aggregated and summarized. That's what map reduces in, in totality. And so the reason why we do this is this abstraction of a mapper and a reducer gives you a very powerful abstraction to do whatever you want uh, in terms of how you create these tuples. Remember, databases also provide UDF functionalities, user-defined functions, but they're not that integrated well. They don't have dependency management integrations correctly sorted out and a whole host of other issues in which you can't really run um, any piece of code that you want. But MapReduce actually provides you that capability. You could be doing some sort of regression here uh, in, and you could be doing image processing. You could be calling some other network call to doing some more data fetch of like you know converting this uh, file name into some something unique that you need from the file maybe it was so you could do a lot of complex logic into your mapper and a lot more complex logic also in your reducer so that abstraction on being able to work on this data field and and run arbitrary code that is what map reduce provided right and not just that but also it provided the capability where you could do this across machines in a very fault tolerant way one little thing I learned from this book was this paradigm of MapReduce was, was put in Google for one main reason. They had a 5% uh, pre preemption rate, which is way higher than hardware fault tolerance that you need, right? Hardwares don't really uh, you know, fail this much, uh, but this was built for high fault tolerance when a machine or a job could be preempted, meaning if it was working on something, it could be said, hey, stop and then some other machine has to do the work or the machine falls, fails through or whatever. But Google, when they first introduced this concept of MapReduce, um, in a very famous paper around 2000 -ish, 2004, um, their main design principle was very high uh, preemption rates, wherein, and that's 5%, and hardware is, is less than 1% if you look at uh, the, the amount of time the hardware fails. And the reason is they have, uh, they use commodity hardware and they have jobs that could have higher priority because they can get paid more. And so when those higher priority jobs come in, those lower priority batch data processing jobs that don't have a strict SLA have to be pre preempted out. 
So when that happens, they started noticing that if they wanted to use the capacity of all the machines, but at the same time optimize for higher uh, priority jobs, which are coming from, let's say, a high, high build customer, then they would want to support them with a higher SLA, but at the same time still use the entire system. So then what they did was they wanted um, those jobs to be killed at a much higher rate and still the job, still the processing should happen, albeit very slowly. So that was one of the drawbacks, but also this paradigm uh, opened up uh, this entire Hadoop ecosystem, which we'll get into later, um, and it, it gave us massive parallelization of data processing, right? Tens of thousands of machines now can do this batch data processing over petabytes of data today. So scale is something that they have figured out. Even the data storage is now very flexible, right? You could, the data that is stored in HDFS through this system is very flexible in terms of what you can store, which was not the case for the MPPs, massively parallel processing systems, uh, which Teradata and other systems provided. Um, so this, this introduced many important things. The number one was high scale of data processing, high fault tolerance, right? Um, and it, it, it was something that was uh, validated to scale across uh, uh, large scale, right? Um, so we went through fault tolerance, uh, and yeah, so there are, there are this one other concept that I forgot to talk about, which is the hash function or the join function, right? How do you do the join? How do you do, um, uh, what algorithm would you use, right? And so there's many algorithms uh, in the book, broadcast hash, partition hashed and various other ways. But think about it this way. When would you want to you know, move data over? When would you not want to move? Where is the data located? What key should you use? There's multiple um, things that you have under your control as a developer, but at the same time, the system, the framework gives you a lot more of those built-in capabilities, those algorithms that you can use for partitioning, for hashing, for how you compute, where you compute, and, and so on and so forth that you can leverage, which now comes with uh, the MapReduce ecosystem. Um, one other key thing is hotkeys, right? Now we, we saw here that 2.css had a lot, this reducer had two times the effort that this reducer had, right? But what if this reducer had a million keys that it had to you know, process when this only had two, right? So let's say this is an example where uh, you you have uh, let's say a social network you're connected to let's say around three to four hundred people but let's say there's a celebrity now they're connected to millions of people right so when they do something the data analysis or the batch jobs for them actually has a heavy rights queue or those keys are very hot when you have to those reducers that end up processing for those celebrities end up doing a lot more job so it's very important to understand how do you optimize for that how do you um, have those hot keys taken care of. You could whitelist, you could have an uh, algorithm that you run that flags those keys and then distributes the jobs even more and multiple other things you'd have to do. So it feels easy, this map reduce paradigm, but when you start to use it, you realize that there's so much inefficiencies, so many design principles that you don't probably need. Like your machines don't really fail that much. You have dedicated cluster for doing batch processing and a whole host of other things, right? So beyond MapReduce is, is the next topic, right? Um, so we talked about MPPs um, briefly, which is massively parallel processing systems, which are very restrictive in the kind of data that you load, the kind of schema that it supports, the kind of querying, and a whole host of other, you know, you can't run arbitrarily code. That's what led to the MapReduce uh, system. So MPPs led to, the inflexibilities led to MapReduce paradigm, right? So when, when you had storage flexibility, like, a lot of scale was opened up. Processing capabilities, right? Uh, you could write this processing in any different language you want. Java is, uh, is, the, is the one that is most famously used, but it also opened up that. It also gave you huge fault tolerance that didn't exist before. And we talked about the 5% chance of preemption, which was the main core design principle for, for this entire system. And so let's go forward. Even here, right, if you had to write a mapper job and a reducer job, and if you had to write all of that in the Java code, it'll be at least a couple, couple lines of code, maybe 100 at max lines of code based on the complexity. And so it, it, there was a need for a higher level abstraction, which could, you know, um, abstract away that mapper and reducer code 
And so that's where pig and hive came in. Hive is more SQL-like. You can, you can uh, write uh, SQL type queries. Pig is more using pig Latin and others, which further abstracts away writing of the mapper and reducer code for you. So you just have to worry about the data flow, right? Um, so that's what came in. Various API programming model tools were built on top of MapReduce to make it further easier for different categories of people, programmers with using scripting. Um, but then there's data analytics folks who use this Hive and a whole host of other things, right? So MPP led to MapReduce, then that to uh, different paradigm models. But now the focus is on more efficiency, right? We saw so many inefficiency here. And so you saw that we, we went from scale to programming model improvements to efficiency to now expanding the use case, right? So what are some of the efficiency? We already talked about it, but let's go through them really quickly. And Spark is the, the next one, the next big thing that's actually uh, improving a lot of inefficiencies here in the typical MapReduce system. Um, and so let's see how it does that, right? So it allows for stream support. Um, it doesn't do um, sort when it doesn't need to. The output of a mapper is always sorted, but you might realize that you might not need that, right? Uh, so it doesn't do unnecessarily uh, sorts when it's not needed. It, all of these are stored uh, outputs, like all of these tuples are materialized views. And so when that happens, they're materialized the artifacts, not views. When those artifacts are produced, they're replicated. And so you might not need all of these artifacts, temporary artifacts to be built, there's a lot of overhead when you have to create them, right? So unnecessarily materialized intermediate state is not produced. Even, even this whole workflow requires some sort of a coordination system like Azkaban or things like that, right? Um, and so it's not viewed as one thing. It's like one block creates output to the other one. And so you could have series of mappers and reducers, right? You, typical system would have, a, 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 let's say Google or LinkedIn, probably have hundreds of these chains together. Mapper, reducer, reducer's output to another mapper to reducer, mapper to reducer, and so on and so forth. And so when that happens, you realize how much data is being produced. And at some point when something fails, it has to be restarted, right? So there's a lot of inefficiency on the kind of data that's produced. Even the, the flow is not seen end to end, right? Um, so in, in Spark, the entire flow is, see, is seen as, as one, one flow, right? Which, is, which greatly enhances its speed. So the entire engine is one job, right? It doesn't, it skips sorts when it does not need it. Uh, it uses memory as much as possible when it, when it, when it has to materialize some state, it does. Um, and also for every, each of these mapper and reducers, the JVM um, new instance is created per task, right? But now you can reuse those existing processes for those execution. I think the key, key term there is operators. So Spark uses operators where it can, it can reuse those existing operators. Um, and uh, it uses, you know, RDDs, Resilient Distributed Data Sets. Basically, this data set is needed when it has to recompute. Let's say something fails. Here it is easy. You create a file output, uh, and if it's fully created, that means it passed. If it doesn't, then you, if it's partially created, you discard it. And so this state is very easy to restart. And it's, it's atomic in the sense that uh, the same input will lead to the same output, but here you have to keep track as to at, within this flow, what data was used and what where are we in the given state. So RDDs is used. So this is all eventually progressing uh, from MPPs to MapReduce to Pig and Hive data model. And then efficiency is the key uh, name of the game here. A lot of efficiency around how it's executed, but also developer efficiency is huge. Um, eventually leading to graph and iterative style um, like uh, processing, which is also briefly covered in the book so to end, let, let me give you a quick overview of the Hadoop ecosystem. We use a lot of terms, but let's see how it actually fits together, right? Because I had the same question. Uh, so HDFS is the underlining layer, which is the file storage system. On top is a cluster resource management, which is Yarn. Um, and then there's data processing, which is MapReduce, which we saw. So this entire system is the Hadoop ecosystem, right? And then this, this entire system runs on top, which is the Hive, uh, SQL-like processing, pig script-like processing, and then there's Mahout and others, which are which are used for uh, um, data analytics folks and others, various mathematical operations that you can run on top of your jobs. Um, then there's HBase, which is a column store that runs on top of HDFS. 
Spark, which also uses some parts of MapReduce and others, but also leverages HDFS. Askaban for workflow management. Um, and Zookeeper for coordination, which we talked about in the last few videos, right? So all of this is, is, is the Hadoop ecosystem. And these are all open source software, which come together and sit on top of each other to actually build for such massively parallel uh, batch processing system. So this was quite insightful in the sense that uh, the system is evolving. It has grounds in terms of uh, Unix as the key inspiration, which was pretty interesting in this chapter as to how Unix inspired a lot of this batch processing. Uh, we looked at an example of MapReduce. We looked at how it evolved and a quick overview on the Hadoop ecosystem. So in the next video, we will learn about uh, streams.